So I asked Ellie a week or two ago if she and Alex could sing A Change Is Gonna Come by Sam Cooke after the sermon this morning. I thought it would just be a great fit. And I had just seen the movie One Night in Miami. Probably, I know some of you have seen it or heard about it. It's a fictitious retelling of a true evening that happened in February of 1964 when Cassius Clay, soon to convert to the Nation of Islam and change his name to Muhammad Ali, won the heavyweight boxing title. And the movie is about this evening of celebrating or talking that Muhammad Ali spent with Malcolm X and the football player Jim Brown and the entertainer singer Sam Cooke. And the movie really revolves around the men and their relationships with one another and their relationship with kind of the demon, the dominant, dominating force of racism that is just in everywhere all the time. The movie doesn't really dwell on that. It really looks at the men and their creative responses from Malcolm X, you know, the more militant separatist, to Sam Cooke, who was, you know, trying to sing to white audiences and black audiences. Cooke was really an unparalleled talent. His father was a traveling preacher. And so by the time Sam Cooke was five years old, he was singing in the churches um, with his brothers and sisters. And by the, by the time he was 20, he was really a quite well-known gospel singer. He was kind of one of the lead voices with a very well-known group called the Soul Stirrers. And he had this incredibly buttery, beautiful voice. Most of the people in the church were shouters and he was a crooner. And his father told him never to let anything limit him, not to let anything anything inside or any outside. And he didn't. By the time he died at 33, he had 30 hits, pop hits, but he also um, was singing in Las Vegas at the clubs and also singing on civil rights movement stages. He had signed a movie contract and he had his own record label. So he was just this unparalleled talent. And like Ellie said, yeah, we can't sing Sam Cooke because only Sam Cooke can sing Sam Cooke with this, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, he was just his own am amazing voice. And that's really what we get today in the gospel. Jesus' fame is spreading wild, wildly and widely. Jesus is this incredible, authentic voice. And while he's kind of facing this really tough, kind of all these forces that are standing against him, the scripture is very much looking at Jesus, and it tells us twice that nobody is like him. He speaks with one who has this authority. Who is this? What is this? A new teaching. How is it that he can speak with such power? And of course, in part, it's because he's just come out of the waters of baptism, and he's just heard those beautiful words that we all hear too. We're all what? cherished, treasured children of God, every single one of us. That's who we are. It's what Howard Thurman called the sound of the genuine. Thurman said that there is in every single one of us, a part of us that waits and listens for the sound of the genuine deep inside of us. And until we find it and hear it, we spend all of our time searching and if we finally hear the sound of the genuine and we don't follow it, we might as well not have been born because we'll spend all of our life just on the strings that other people are pulling. He was so clear that every single one of us needed to le listen deeply for this sound inside of us, not just when we're at our strongest, but that part of us that, as Thurman said, was the most literal, irreducible part of us, the part of us that we want to feel thoroughly and completely understood, where we can let our guard down and not feel like we will be destroyed, that part of us where we can be completely vulnerable, completely naked, completely exposed, and absolutely secure. That's what every single one of us wants and needs, to be absolutely Holly or Ellie or Paula, nobody else but who we truly are. And that's what other people need from us too. Thurman went on to say, we need to listen for the sound of the genuine in others, the sound of the genuine in our mother and our father and our children and our spouse. And that of course can be hard to hear 
I mean, we know right now lots of families are feeling estranged. There's a lot of tension about differing political views, about different opinions and how we move forward and estrangement from just years of hurt that have been built up. Even when you're close to people around you, sometimes it's hard to hear the sound of the genuine in them because their voice is so familiar. I cannot tell you how many times my father has told me about seeing Jim Brown play in the Cotton Bowl in 1957. When Jim Brown came down with Syracuse to play against TCU, Jim Brown scored three touchdowns. He also kicked the extra points, scored three of them. He was the most valuable player, but TCU still won 28 to 27. I have heard that story a lot of times. This last week, the Dallas Morning News ran another version of the story that most people hadn't heard that came out really after the movie One Night in Miami kind of took to the stage about another angle to that cowboy game, to that cotton bowl game, which was that Jim Brown faced all kinds of death threats, that he was only the second black player to show up to play in a cotton bowl. They didn't do that down in Texas. They were coming from New York, used to integrated teams, but not in Dallas. And the story told about how the FBI were right outside that 21 year old's room. So that story kind of opened up another story, another depth of discussion with me and my father about how things have changed and how things haven't changed. And of course, always reminding me of how football meant so much to my father, the role of mentors and um, coaches in his life. But um, Thurman isn't just talking about listening in the sound of the genuine in ourselves and in our mothers and fathers and the people we love. He says we have to listen to the sound of the genuine in the one that we cannot stand. He says in the one that we would do away with if we could. The one we would kill off except we know in doing it, it would destroy us too. Honestly, I think about those people behind the policy that separated those children from their parents at the border. I think about those people who have driven this insurrection. Those people who have driven that whole QAnon craziness to actually try to get people to believe that Democrats are a satanic worshiping cult that has an international sex trafficking ring. I mean, really? How can you possibly listen for the sound of the genuine in all of that noise? But then sometimes you hear something and it just opens your heart just a tiny bit. A couple of weeks ago, the New Yorker, their radio hour podcast had Luke Mogelson. He's a really gifted writer. He was embedded with... Um, our troops in Afghanistan for four years, and he spent the last year embedded with insurrectionists, if you will. And he was there at the Capitol on January 6th. He um, had his press credentials hidden. He was right there in the middle of the throng. And he wrote this story about what he witnessed. I mean, it's really a long story in the New Yorker. But what jumped out at me in the interview was how he described many of the people. No doubt, of course, there were those who were armed and loaded for bear and had a plan, but he talked about how so many people just looked lost, how they wandered around on the Senate chamber floor after they'd broken in and then really didn't know what to do. Maybe I should call my dad, he heard one person say. They just looked so lost. And I thought about all the other scholars we've heard who've said that, who've said that behind all of this, this desperation and loneliness and a feeling that your voice doesn't count and a feeling that you're disconnected from everyone. And then the next story was, I was just blown away. Reed Berkowitz, he's some genius game designer the kind of person who designs ARGs, alternate reality games, nothing I know anything about, but think Dungeons and Dragons, think 
action role play. Think those kind of games that kids play, adults too, that start off behind the computer, but then often call you out into the real world where you connect with people and you're searching down clues and trying to serve a mystery. And at its best, as Berkowitz said, it's the kind of thing that builds up your self-esteem because maybe you come up with the clue, maybe you answer something and a kid thinks, yeah, I'm going to go to school tomorrow. I feel good now. And Berkowitz talked about how distraught he was when he first came upon QAnon and knew it for what it was, an ARG, an alternative reality game. And he realized people, game designers, were designing this kind of thing. It has all the fixtures, all the techniques and all the tools. And that's why it goes on. And that's why it hooks you in. And he was just so distraught. And the reporter asked him, you know, well, if it's possible to engineer a game that pulls people into the dark, could you re-engineer the game to pull people out of it and back into the light? And he said, no, the answer to a game is not another game. The answer is a nice, welcoming, affirming community where these people really feel seen and heard where they feel like they belong, like they're cherished children of God, right? And she said, though, so you don't want to ostracize them. He said, oh, no, no, you want to keep them close. You want to keep them really close. And I have to be honest, I've listened to that now. And I want to tell you something. I don't think I can do that. I don't think I know how. I mean, that's Peace Church. He was like, he was describing Peace Church, like we're supposed to go out and get these people and draw them close to us. And let me tell you, there's no part of me that feels up to that challenge or eager for it. And yet, if not, if we can't pull one another close, how are we ever going to hear the sound of the genuine in one another or even in ourselves? And then every once in a while, there's a moment, a moment like those last couple of minutes in the inauguration, when that young Amanda Gorman, she stood up there, what authority, what power, what authenticity. And I mean, for a moment, I mean, really, <laughs> for a moment, didn't you really know change is gonna come? I mean, for just a moment, <laughs> didn't you really know this country could be something, right? I mean, didn't you really believe, who could hear that, really? That sound of that genuine. It's like Thurman said, maybe if I hear the sound of the genuine in me and you hear the sound of the genuine in you, it's just possible that I can go down in me and come up in you and all the walls will fall away because the sound of the genuine is the same sound in everyone. May the gift of God's voice, the gift of God's powerful, authentic, beautiful voice, give us the strength, the strength to share the deepest part inside of us that we can move forward together in God's holy strength. Amen.